Hey YouTube, my name is April Crosley. I'm super excited. I have a guest that I'm quote unquote interviewing, but we're pretty laid back here at Lazy Girl REI with our <laughs> interviews. They're really informal. I'm a real estate investor based out of Pennsylvania. That's where my businesses are. I flip houses. I own small multifamily and I also do private lending. Currently traveling the country in my RV with my husband. We sold our house in Pennsylvania. So now we're kind of nomads and we're traveling all over the United States. Thank you for following us. Click like, make sure you subscribe so you can check out all our videos from previously. And today I have a guest with us, Becky, who I'm super excited to talk to. We've been trying to coordinate this for months. <laughs> um, <laughs> Becky runs a fantastic group on Facebook called Lady Landlords, which is huge. I mean, the group is huge. Um, is uh -huh. really passionate about helping women get into rental investing and growing well. So I'm excited to have her here today. And Becky, I'm going to let you just roll with it and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and your story and how you got into real estate. Sure. Thank you so much for having me on. Like I said, I've been looking forward to having this chat with you for months now. So I, I'm a New Yorker. That's where I currently am. I actually just got back. I was living in the Dominican Republic for the past three months. Got home about a week ago, back to snowy, rainy New York here, but <laughs> we'll be fine there. I am a cancer researcher by day and a real estate investor by night. I fell into real estate investing in 2018. I had, before that, I used to own a tour company in Spain. I owned a bar in Portugal. I used to own a bus that actually took people from Spain to Portugal and back the other way. But I, unfortunately, I made a bad business decision and moved back to the States in about 2013, pretty much broke and penniless and kind of homeless at the time. Um, but a couple years ago, my now husband actually really wanted to buy a house. He's an immigrant from the Dominican Republic. He very much came here with that American dream and home ownership is a huge part of that. So I said, okay, fine. We can talk about buying a house, but I am not going to buy a house and live like mortgage payment to mortgage payment. We got to find a way that we can make money off of living in real estate. I thought I came up with the most original best idea ever with buying a multifamily and living in one side and renting out the other. I really, I had never heard of house hacking. I had no idea that this was actually a thing. But once we closed and we got that money from the rental property on day one, I was hooked and I was like, that's it. We are doing this again. And so far in the past two years, we've been able to acquire 10 units within New York and then also the Dominican Republic. Nice. Cool. Cool. So tell me um, a little bit about, so your units are in New York and I have a lot of people that reach out to me <laughs> from New York asking me to coach them and I'm like, and I don't do a ton of coaching anymore at all. And I'm, my response is always New York is a different monster. So let <laughs> yeah. me find you a coach from New York. Things just run <laughs> a little different up there. It's, yes. And I know it kind of varies depending where you're at in New York, but kind of what type of areas do you invest in or own your rentals in there? Because a lot of things people say are one, it's so expensive and two, yes. they don't feel it's landlord friendly. So talk a little bit about those hurdles because obviously you've overcome those. I mean, this is your home state and that's where you're buying. So. Yeah. And I, I get that same thing all the time. People think I'm crazy for investing in New York. I actually love it. And clearly there's so many other people that want to invest in New York. And I don't think we should be held back by those things. So I actually invest in Yonkers and the Bronx. So for people that don't know New York so well, that's about 10 minutes outside of New York city. So literally I could walk to, I could walk to New York city from where I currently live. We are an incredibly urban place. Yonkers itself is the fourth largest city in New York. It is exactly what you expect. You know, people walk everywhere. You don't need to drive. We have public transportation. That is, we are still in the very urban kind of area. We do also own one property about an hour north of here. Um, kind of more of like your typical suburban type area. But still, when I usually tell the price on what we paid for that property, people are like, okay, New York is still overpriced. I think that's probably, I'll address the tenant issues first. So people always, New York, California are like top of the list when people think about places that aren't landlord friendly. It doesn't bother me. If we play within the rules that we're given and you know the game, 
it still works out. I don't think that they're like, I definitely understand that it's that there's other states that would be more landlord friendly, but I don't think that New York is like against us. I don't think that they are, I don't think that there's things like, fine, there are probably some laws and regulations that I wish might be a little bit different that maybe I could take advantage of in a different way. But I don't think that there's anything there that I'm like, oh, that's so crazy. That's so illegal. They're like holding me back. It's just, these are what the rules are and you have to play by them. So, and I, I, like I said, I don't think that there's anything there that makes my diff- my business difficult to run. I haven't, I don't feel that way. Um, price is definitely a thing. It is expensive here. And I do completely agree. Um, and I work with women that are looking to invest in New York and it is coming up with a little bit of a different plan for them because prices are expensive. It's where house hacking might be the best kind of entry way point in. Sometimes you have to look at maybe doing a little bit more work than you had planned on. But what I like about New York is it might cost more, but I feel that you can find really good cash flow deals here. And my personal goal is to own the least amount of property for the most amount of money. I like so for that. me, New- <laughs> right? I want the least amount of doors, the least amount of headaches with driveways and roofs and properties and tenants for the most amount of money. And honestly, New York has gotten me there much faster. I have a better cash flow with my 10 properties than some people that might have 50 properties in a different state. Yeah, I love that. And oh. people don't understand that. Someone just posted a question in a group this morning on Facebook and said, how many doors do I have to own for financial freedom? Because I know a guy that owns 30 and he's not financially free and he's miserable. And I'm like, I know people that own 10 and they're financially free. Yeah. I know people that own 600 units and they're drowning in personal debt and just keep syndicating just to like keep getting fees, yeah. cash flow and just keep going and going and going. And like mm-hmm. you said, like if you own 10 properties that are like cream of the crop and they cash flow yeah. well for you and they don't have a lot of issues, then you don't need to own 20, 40, 60, 80, 150 exactly. properties like at all. <laughs> don't get me wrong. Real estate's addicting. Sometimes you want to keep buying, yes. but sometimes you're like, all right, I, I'm good. Like there is no magical number of doors. So I love Next. that. I'm so happy you said that because that's one of the things that like drives me crazy that people ask all the time is like, oh, how many doors do I need to buy? Like, what's this magic number that then I'll just hit financial freedom? And I'm like, okay, well, April, you might be able to live off of $5,000 a month, but I might need $10,000 a month. Maybe I, you know, so how can you and I have that same number? And I think people get way, so one, our, all of our situations are different. We all have different expenses. We all have different things going on in our lives that we need money for and what we want our lifestyle to look like regardless of actual bills. But I feel that people get so competitive about how many doors they have when it's like, who cares? Mm -hmm. Who cares if you have one or 10, if it still brings you an extra $500 a month. So I, I find that competitiveness of people not having enough doors just it makes no sense to me. We should be talking cash flow. How much cash flow do you have? And is that put you in the position of financial freedom or not? Right. Because same thing, my cash flow and your cash flow for financial freedom are going to be incredibly different. So right. how close are we to our financial freedom is really what we should be our indicator of success, not how many doors I own. Right. Drives yeah. me crazy. I tell people like, look at that. What is your freedom number? And then back into that freedom number. Like I need X amount of cash flow. So if I'm buying in New York and I'm buying B class properties and they cash flow this much per door, this is how many I need to get to this yeah. freedom number. Like that's what you want to be figuring out. And you also have to be willing to kind of change things up or see how kind of things fit into the picture. So I'd mentioned I own one property upstate. It sounds really random. I always call that property my COVID baby because that I was not planning on buying a house in 2020. I actually like promised my husband we would not buy another house. (laughs) Like we like all agreed to it. We talked to our accountant and it was just like, okay, we're not buying a house in 2020. And then March hit and I was like, okay, world's upside down. None of us have any idea. No one. I work in the medical field and did not think that this would end up in the place that we were at. So then by like the end of April, May, I was just like, there's got to be a good opportunity here. Here we're in New York. Everybody's looking for different space. Not everybody was buying at the time because it was still like two and upheaval. So I actually said, let's pick up a property about an hour away. And I said, I wanted something that, it had to be um, turnkey. I wasn't doing work or putting up 
putting together a team in our way. That sounds stupid to me. It needed to have tenants that were actually there and paying. I wanted to actually inherit tenants, which people thought I was crazy for saying during the moratorium, but that was a requirement. And it needed to be, and then once again, it had to be about an hour away so I could self-manage it. So we have this, and we ended up finding the perfect property that fit what I was looking for. It doesn't fit into my portfolio and my model of what I was doing, but it made sense for the time. And it's one of our best cash flowing properties. It just fit with what we were looking for, but it was, okay, we have to change kind of this. I like this urban for family. So, okay, we got to go a little bit out of the box, but it's still something that I was able to take that cash flow and put it in my bucket to get to my financial freedom number. Yeah. Good. So when you started, you house hacked a duplex, correct? Correct. Okay. And then where did you go from the duplex? How did you get to the next one? Because I find sometimes, sometimes people get stuck in the house hack. And I'm with you. When I started, we ha house hacked. I didn't know it was called house hacking. We were just yeah, like, oh, neither. this is awesome. Let's <laughs> fix up this house where we live here, then move out and turn it into a rental and do it again. But now it's house hacking. <laughs> so yes. um, how do you get from property one to property two? Because I find sometimes people get stuck there. I completely agree. I feel like getting the second property, people have more of a problem with than getting the first. Mm -hmm. I feel like we can all figure out how to like go through it the first time, but the second tends to be more difficult. So oddly enough, when we were buying the duplex, as typically happens, our realtor came to the property to do that appraisal. And as the appraisal was being done, it's this quaint little like neighborhood that we bought that duplex in. And a lot of elderly people live here. It's been a street of multifamilies for, for decades. So this little old lady went over to my realtor and was like, hey, this is my neighborhood. I don't know you. What are you doing here? Right? So like everybody has that old lady in the neighborhood, right? She sits on her porch and just watches everything that goes on. So he said, hey, I'm a realtor. Um, I'm representing buyers. We're doing the appraisal. So she said, oh, I live across the street. I might be interested in selling my house. Keep in touch. He never mentioned this to me. Didn't know any of this at the time. So like I said, when we closed on that duplex and I got that check, I was like, this is amazing. We're doing this again. Yeah. I was like, I explained to my husband, like, sorry, like, this is what's happening. So the day after closing, I called my realtor and my mortgage broker. And I was like, I want to buy another house. And they were like, you're not buying another house. You just closed yesterday. I'm like, no, like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to buy another house. They said, it's too soon. You'll figure it out. So that's when I went on like my journey to figure out how to buy like homes and started investing in real estate resources and finding all these groups and networking with people and all that. But I'd always kept in touch with my realtor and my mortgage broker. So probably about six months later, when I called my monthly realtor, my monthly meeting with my realtor to tell him I'm going to buy another house, instead of him saying, no, it's too soon on the sixth month, he said, I think I actually have a property for you. It's an off-market property. I need you to get pre-approved, but if you can get pre-approved, I'll tell you about the house. So I said, okay. So I'm on the phone with my mortgage broker now, trying to get us pre-approved. My husband happened to go outside to go to work, whatever he was doing, and he calls me and he goes, it was weird. I saw a realtor coming out of the house across the street. <laughs> So I get my pre-approval. Now we know exactly what this house is. Basically, just as much as I had stayed in touch with my realtor, letting him know what I wanted, the, he stayed in touch with the little lady from across the street and they finally decided to sell their property. They hired my realtor and then he just took, put it, made it an off-market deal. And then once we got pre-approved, he told us about the property and then we just went over and met with the, uh, met with the little old lady and her husband and decided to buy the house. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. So it's a, it's a four family with a driveway with like a parking lot, like attached. So like this excites us as New Yorkers. Yeah. That's a <laughs> to big have deal parking. in Northeast. Yeah. To have parking. Yes. <laughs> to have parking. So we also got a parking lot that came along with the four family. Nice. Sweet. Yeah. So continuing that journey as you buy, when you buy, are you buying traditionally like through a mortgage broker, like putting 25% down, financing the rest? So everything we've bought so far has actually been traditional financing. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So we have not had to go into other strategies quite yet. So yeah. I keep them like hanging there. I'm aware of what like I could do, need to do. Yeah. But for me, if I can, I feel like sometimes we overcomplicate things in real estate investing. But yeah. if this, if I can just go get a traditional mortgage, why not just do that? 
Yeah. Yeah. And everybody does things differently and has like their different path to getting exactly. there, you know? So it's like, it all comes back to what we were talking before about the financial freedom number, like stop getting stuck in listening to the way one person's doing things and thinking I have to do it that way. Like a lot of people yeah. think I have to quit my job. I have to flip houses. I have to own a hundred units. You don't have to do anything. Like the no. whole, the reason people typically get into this is like, just financial freedom and freedom in general, or setting up a better retirement for themselves. Like, I don't know if you follow mm -hmm. Michael Zuber, but he talks about it all the time where I'm it's like, he has a book called one rental at a time. He'd be awesome. I'm going to connect you with him. Okay. But he, same thing, like worked a full-time job and he just was like slowly buying rental properties. And I mean, yeah, yeah it's like, you follow your own path and journey and what you want to do. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, no, I wish more people heard, heard you say that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll put this out on YouTube and they will. Yeah. <laughs> um, how did you get, I know you're, you said your husband's from the Dominican Republic. So I'm super curious about that because my, <laughs> my business partner's family is from the Dominican Republic. Oh. Yeah. So how did you break into that market and what are the differences between investing there and investing in New York? <laughs> Okay. I actually prefer investing in New York, yeah, <laughs> which once again, as we started with, most people don't. So it was very important to my husband to buy a property in his home country. He moved to the States like only 10, 12 years ago, right? So really most of his life has still been in the Dominican Republic. He really wanted to be able to buy their own in his home country. And I, whenever I tell people I own in the Dominican Republic, they're like, oh my God, which beach? Let me see pictures. Can I go stay there? And I'm like, no, no, no. This is not a short-term rental. We actually bought a long-term rental in the capital in Santo Domingo. Okay. And that was, that's, so that's the property we have. We actually rent it out. It's rented out to college kids that live there year long. But what ended up being different there, I mean, kind of everything. So fine, there's still mortgages. It's by far our cheapest property, but we chose to still mortgage it at the beginning because we were buying that fourplex across the street Mm -hmm. At the same time, we wanted as much cash on hand. So we decided still to mortgage it. You have to put down, we complain here in the States about having to put down like 20, 25%. We think that's like blasphemy. There, I think we put down like 35%. Okay. Still, numbers wise, it was still a lot less than what we would put down here. But still, we put down 35%. It was new construction and it's in an apartment complex. So we knew the area. It was somebody, something that, we want was we were able to get by where my husband grew up and where he still has some family members. So we know that in case of an emergency, they can get there. So that was important to us. It is in that up and coming kind of area. Really, really nice. But mortgages are done very different. They don't do 30 year mortgages. They do like seven year mortgages. Wow. Also interest, interest rates are much higher. We did great getting our 9% interest. Wow. which is a balloon rate, which goes up to like 14% in like another couple of years. And interest is also calculated daily. So your balance of the loan changes every single day. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So, which apparently, so I speak some Spanish. My husband's clearly fluent. I speak some. Am I able to read these documents, no, they're hard enough to read in English to read a, yeah. a lender's, <laughs> to read your own mortgage. I couldn't do that in Spanish. So I actually wasn't aware of that daily increase every single day. So actually my husband and I, once we caught on to that, we actually ended up paying it off um, already. We paid that property off. But we had actually left it there for a while just because we wanted that cash on hand. We are still in acquisition phase for us. Once mm -hmm. again, thinking about you as an individual. So we actually, since we were able to still rent it out and get it to cash flow, and I mean cash flow like, you know, that like $9 a month with the conversion that we got was still perfectly worth it to us um, to be able to then keep the rest of our money on hand to go buy another property. We didn't care that it was our least cash flowing property. So that stuff was different. Um, you still can do the whole LLC. There are actually places in foreign countries where you can Per, get a mortgage in another country as an American citizen. So we use my husband's, he is, he's a dual citizen. So we used his residency to be able to do it. We clearly got more favorable terms, but that is still something that an American can do. 
now when we were down there for these past three months, now it was supposed to be my turn to get that beachfront property, to get that short-term rental. And April, it did not work out as I thought. Yeah. <laughs> what was interesting about the market now is prices there are still really high for beach properties. Mm -hmm. I thought with COVID, I thought we'd go pick up a steal. I was like, there's no tourism. Places are completely empty. All-inclusive resorts just didn't even open this year. Wow. You know, no one's flying. There was a, when we first got to the Dominican Republic in December, there was a curfew that you would be home by noon. Wow. By noon. Yeah. So you had to like get up, do your grocery shop and hope you had food until the next day because otherwise you weren't supposed to be on the streets. It's like that was it. So we thought we would be able to pick up a deal down there. Prices were still the same. They were still the same rates as pre-COVID. There are still people buying properties down there, but they're buying their own personal second, third, fourth homes. Mm -hmm. So they don't, and they don't want to rent it out. They're not looking to have, in the world of now germs here in a pandemic, they don't want anybody staying in their house. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to see that these prices were still rather high, but there's no tourism. So for us to have bought a beach rental, we would not be making, we probably wouldn't be making any money. We would still be spending money on carrying costs for at least the next year, probably two years. Wow. Interesting. And so we were like, okay, if we were going to take $200,000 to go buy that beachfront property, I would rather use that money now in New York to buy, I can buy a million dollar asset for that $200,000 here, yeah. get it cash flowing on day one. Then in three years, take the profit from that and then go buy my beachfront property. Because why am I going to spend that same amount of money that I could use as a cash flowing asset to sit there and have to pay for it for an indefinite amount of period of time as of now? We have no idea when things are, are changing or people will travel more or restrictions be lifted. Right. So it just didn't, it made me so sad to leave there without a property, but it just did not make financial sense for us. Right. For somebody else, maybe it does. Right. Yeah. Just a couple things I want to point out. Like you, sometimes people don't understand the amount of like research that goes into real estate investing. Like <laughs> New York, you're familiar with the Dominican, you're not. So people sometimes get super excited about like, oh, I want to buy a beachfront property and here's why. But clearly based on everything you've said, like you did your research while you were there. Plus you have some boots yeah. on the ground because your husband has contacts and family there, which is awesome. Like for me, yeah. we've been looking to buy out of state, just larger multifamily and things. But I, people will come to me all the time and say, oh, I have this great mobile home park or this great multifamily here. And I'm like, I, who do you have as boots on the ground? Like, who do you yeah. know in that market that knows that market, like the back of their hand? There's a lot more research that goes into just financing in the market and everything than it's not as simple as like, oh, I'm just going to pick up this property because I have money or because I want it or whatever. Yeah. Well, I think two things. One, I think a lot of people are just like, oh, I just want this. Right. And I feel like right now, a lot of people I'm picturing, do you remember that toy as like a kid or maybe your son had it where you had to put like the shape of like the star into like the star and then mm -hmm. like the ball that it kind of fits. Yeah. I feel, and like the circle's got to go in a circle. I feel like right now investors are like just jamming that star into the circle being like, this deal doesn't make sense. The numbers don't make sense, but I want this property. So I'm just going to manipulate it, whatever I can. So I feel like we need to be careful about that because people are picking up properties that I think aren't necessarily in alignment with their goals yes. that I think is going to come back and make it difficult. Then going back to other things that I feel like people, we've got to start like a series of like things that real estate investors say, like we'll have to make like some skit or something like this. <laughs> but like one of the other things I feel like I see all the time is like, Hey, what's a good place to invest? And once again, what good means, means the different things to different people. Mm -hmm. But I agree, we should be looking for a place where we at least know someone, maybe a friend from back in college that we talk to once a year or see on Facebook. And you're like, oh, you know what? Mesa, Arizona. I want to invest there. I know April's in the area. At least in that way, she can tell me what the neighborhoods are like. So that way I know this neighborhood's good to buy in. This is a B, this is an A, this is a C. I have an emergency person or even just a place that you like to personally go visit. Maybe I like to go to Fort Myers in Florida every year. So I have an idea of what that place is like. If we're going to just start picking places around the country to buy in, it should be a place where we at least know somebody that lives there. Yeah. 
why not make our lives a little bit easier? Yeah, I agree. It's very helpful to have that. Very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, so tell me about Lady Landlords. Why did you start it? What is, what is it all about and where is it going? Sure. So Lady Landlords, actually for me, I started the Facebook group just a little over a year ago now. And actually I started it at like the beginning of the quarantine really to help myself. I had so many questions about landlording and how to, how this problem pops up or this problem. And we've all been there when you have tenants and you're like, do I do this? Do I do this? I needed people to talk to about it. And when we all got quarantined here in New York and trapped in our homes, you know, my tired, my husband got a little tired of talking real estate with me. So I said, fine, let's go make some friends on the internet then. Yeah. So I knew that I wanted a group that would be directed towards women to help us to be able to find these rental properties and have a safe space for those conversations. So I started Lady Landlords, really, like I said, to ask my own questions. And the group just completely blew up. I thought I was like the only one that would like be in my group. I thought it'd be like me, my mom, and like my best <laughs> friend that I convinced to come join that has no interest in real estate. But since then, we have about a thousand women that come and join our group and our community every single month. Yeah. So from there, it's just kind of grown. It's really opened the doors into just so many different cool opportunities. So now what we did is we put together resources that women in the group are asking for. So we have a beginner's course and an intermediate course about how to scale your properties. We do not only local, but also virtual meetups um, to be able to educate and meet people and see what connections we can make. I also have what's called a roadmap, a roadmap member mentorship project, where as we talked about, people kind of come up with these stereotypical, I need this amount of doors or what's a good investment. So what I do is I work with people on what are your specific goals? What do you actually have currently? And then I help show them how to kind of create that path to bridge those two things together. So it's just crazy what it's kind of turned into on, on the side of just helping other women be able to find the right resources to be able to get their own rental businesses up and going. Yeah, it's awesome. There's like over 10,000 members, I think, or something already. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And we hit 10,000 in the first year. Yeah. I, <laughs> and meanwhile, great. still, I, I still look at it every month and I'm like, I, I just did not know that there were all these other women out there that were struggling with the same questions that I had. Yeah. It's definitely meeting a need. It's awesome. It's really awesome. Thank you. Congrats to you on that, on the growth of that. <laughs> it's been amazing to watch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else you want people to know just about your journey or about their journey in general getting started? Yes. Get started. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is always my best advice. I feel one of the other, we'll add this in the category here, you always hear analysis paralysis for real estate investors. We're always looking for the next book, the next podcast that we can listen to, the next piece of information. And all those things are useful, but until you actually do it in practicality, you're not using any of those resources that you now have. So go out, get started. Think about what your goals are. What do you want to get to? And just like you said, April, people need to work backwards. I want to get to 10K a month. I want to get to $200 a month just to pay my car bill, whatever that may be to you, whatever that's important to you. But go figure out your path to that goal, work your way back, and then do it. Take the first steps and get out there and get your feet wet in real estate investing and the ball just starts rolling from there. Yeah. And you have whole like groups of community support now. It, I mean, <laughs> like lady landlords and other groups, just like you can hop in there and ask a million questions. And when you're done with your analysis, paralysis and burnout on your million questions that you can ask, <laughs> you will finally just jump, but you really do just have to sit down and think about where you're trying to go and how many houses you have to buy or how many apartment buildings you have to buy to get there and just do it. You got to just do it. Yeah. It takes the hard stuff. The, the, instead of talking about it, it takes the research. It takes the nitty gritty. It takes talking to agents and brokers. And it's the not fun stuff that gets you there for sure. Yeah. And honestly, it, it, regardless of how much you research and plan, as you know, April, it's never going to go exactly as planned. There's always going to be something that's going to pop up. And even as many times as I've done this, as you've done this, there's always something new that you're like, really, who would have expected this problem to come up? Where did this come from? So you can, if you're never going to be, par be, be prepared for absolutely everything anyways, why delay getting started yeah. on reaching the goals that you set for yourself? Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Agree. Agree. So Becky, thank you so much. This is awesome. Can you tell people where they can follow you, where to find your groups and where they can find out more about your coaching? Sure. Easiest way to find me is on Facebook in our Facebook group at Lady Landlords. Nice and easy to find me there. You can also follow me on Instagram at Becky Nova 24, and you can learn all about our different resources at lady landlords.com. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. Becky, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. You can follow us and find out more information on, oh, we are on YouTube, on Facebook at Lazy Girl Real Estate Investing. You can follow me on Instagram at April Crosley, and you can email your questions to me, April at LazyGirlREI.com. And ladies, I will see you in the Lady Landlords group <laughs> for sure <laughs> to help answer questions there. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much, Becky. I appreciate you joining us today. Of course. Thanks for having me on. This was Thank exactly you. what I was hoping for today. Sweet. Thank you.